the Volkswagen, outward bound to the highways of the world. This is the story behind Volkswagen, a household word in a hundred languages, the car that built a company and changed an industry. It was so omnipresent on every road, in every place of this world you saw it. You grew up with one. If you didn't have one, your neighbor had one, or your grandma, or your friend. They were everywhere, they were ubiquitous. They were beetles in every little town, and they were the car that stood out. They were the ones with the engine in the rear, they were cooled by air instead of water. They did everything a little bit differently. Everybody has a story with the Volkswagen. Everybody tells you, oh, my first car was a Volkswagen. I learned to drive in a Volkswagen. It has become an icon. It's part of the human story. Just the contrast that a car could begin in Nazi Germany and then end up in the summer of love. It struck a chord in a really deep way with me. It's not a perfect vehicle by any means. It's a car that they people accepted the flaws as being a part of the personality. And globally, it's something that brings people together. And it seemed to make people happy to see when you're driving past somebody. There's something about being in this little car that's really just one of my favorite places in the world it is. The way everybody knew Volkswagen, they were the honest car company. When I met my husband, we bought a VW Bug. We moved with a newborn baby, a dog, and, and a three-year-old to Montana. Brings a smile to your face. My husband restored VWs just for fun. And it was time to do another one. And we happened to be in town shopping and saw this one for sale. The reason he bought it right away was because looking at it, you could tell it had never been wrecked. So we brought the car over here to the cabin, planning to build a shop here in the near future. And he started working on it. You know, life was good. We retired, we were enjoying doing what we wanted to do. So he did, obviously he must have done this primer work? Yes, okay. yeah, he had it right down to fair metal. Yeah. When the doctor diagnosed him, he said, I will not live like this. Make a long story short, in 38 days he was dead. Uh, it was very quick, very unexpected. So the bug was in the barn at the cabin here, um, and it that's where it sat for the next 20 plus years. It just left me kind of in a daze for a long time. You gotta understand, he was not only my husband, but he was also my best friend. We were extremely close. So then it took a long time to get over that, and the car sat here, and... Oh, that turns. Right after my father passed away, we wanted to do something with it. I felt like it would almost be disrespectful if I tried to take over at that point because I didn't have the experience or the knowledge that he did. And, and it was always gonna be something that happened. It just never, it never came to fruition. Well, that's a good sign. It's time to face reality. It's silly to let it sit there and rot. When he passed away, it was in the, the stripped down form where all the parts were wrapped up in paper and kind of labeled and stuffed in boxes. And he had started some primer work um, and that's, as far as he got. So for the last, what is that, 20 something years, it's just been sitting in her barn, disassembled, probably very sentimentally attached, didn't want to let it go. I could kind of tell that it meant something to her on that level. She was getting a little choked up telling me the story. So finally she decided just to go ahead and let it go. I just want it out of here. Are you willing to pay 500 for it? I'm your guy, I'll give you 500 for it. I'll come out with a trailer and haul it back home. I'll keep your number and keep in touch. Somehow there's some comfort of having a certain number of things that are his. But I've got all the memories. Daylight, 22 years. <laughs> all right. Save that Nice. 
nice pack rat nest in there. Careful not to breathe in this. <laughs> Yeah. And this is a book on how to how to keep your Volkswagen alive. The classic. That is the Bible right there. And there's he's got all kinds of notes in it and everything. And I don't know what's in here. License plates. Oh, the license. We bought him a license plate for Christmas that year. This, Get out of here. That's the license plate. Oh my God, that's going on there. That is awesome. What's the date on this thing? Uh, October. October of 1990 is the first entry in this book. Yep. He purchased it for 250 bucks. I thought he paid 350 for it. Maybe that's what he told you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. That's so cool. Oh, that's cool. That's the original manual. That's the original manual to that. It's a 1960 Beetle. How neat is that? Yep, see? August 1959. That's the production date. Oh, Corky. You made my day. Cool. Well, good. Well, it's getting a whole new lease on life now. Yes, and I'm anxious to see it when you get it done. I want to be able to restore this bug and drive it out to her and surprise her with it and show her, Corky, this is what your husband started and I finished it and I just want you to see it and I want to take you on a drive in it. So it means a lot. I've never had took on a project that had this kind of a story behind it and so I'm really excited to uh, do it justice. Here in LA, everybody uses their car like another room in their house. You know, they're doing their nails and texting and on the phone and drinking coffee and pastries and driving to work. And in this, you just tend to be driving a car. That's it. Okay. All right. I'm going to attempt to do a left-hand turn. Good luck with that. The SUVs look pretty big when they come behind Don't they? In the rear view mirror. There's little windows. Like a tank. There's a fucking tank behind us. You play with what you're given. You're doing fine. They don't feel like little cars to me. When I'm in it, it doesn't feel like a little car somehow. But then you realize you see one parked up next to some SUV, you know, some monster car that they build here in the States. And it, it is a little car. Try looking at a Volkswagen this way. It's the only small car with a sealed steel bottom that leaves nothing exposed beneath it. And the VW is built to take a little punishment. In fact, the VW is so well put together, it's practically airtight. Now, what other car gives you this kind of quality at this kind of price? There's a certain nobility about it. There's a certain honesty about it, which I think is what people respected about the Beetle. It's always been a really rugged, kind of trustworthy car. I mean, the Volkswagen seems to have a personality that some other cars lack, and it, it's hard to put a finger on, but to look at it and try to analyze it, there's a softness to the design. It's kind of homely. It's kind of cute. I love the way they look. It's got a little smile on its face, and you approach it from every angle. It's such a pleasing shape. And the Beetle, I think, is friendly all around. It has a nice face, but it's also nice. <laughs> the car is very feminine in a way, but it's also a tomboy. It's very tough, you know? The car has these very nice curves. I mean, it comes from the whole idea of streamlining, but it also has a, a curve that's a very natural and organic curve that you can see in many different forms of nature. Even its nicknames all over the world are usually of animals or creatures of some sort. There's always this organic connection to this car, and I think it looks like it just created itself. Si tout devait recommencer, il ne faudrait pas oublier les coccinelles. Curvilinear forms, in general, are things people react in a warm way to. If you think about the things that are comforting and don't hurt us, when we're babies, breasts, you know, things that are round and soft. Uh, round, soft things. When you're a baby, you're, it's built into us. This is something that provides sustenance, it's warmth, it's friendly. It touches people in a childhood way, you know? It, it's round and it's like something you want to play with. A round form has these connotations. Spiky 
angular forms are things you can get hurt on. You know, a corner, a cactus spike, a hard surface. You can try to explain it through like form and function. This car was tested for 20 years to get to the absolute minimum of what was needed and necessary. I mean, that's, that's what nature does. And so for something to feel natural, it's actually just fulfilling its function with the least amount of work, you know? And I think this car does that. And for whatever reason, that gives us a sense of its life. It feels like it's alive. That's kind of the feeling you get with the Beatles. And I always say that the Beatle is the uh, member of your family that sleeps in the garage. I'm sure that's why the Herbie films came about, because it really, it really does feel like that when you're driving them. There's little quirks in all of them. They all have they speak to you in slightly different ways. It almost has good days and bad days in the same way that I do. <laughs> And I think that uh, companies like Disney did a good job making people think that this car's life. I tell you, there's more going on here than meets the eye. Yeah, they're not alive. Come on. But you wish they were. The first movie I ever saw as a kid was uh, Herbie Goes Bananas. It literally is one of my first real memories. And basically just being completely fascinated and enamored with the fact that this car could be a friend. Most people think of a car as being just transportation, but this was a concept that a car could be one of your best buds. And that's something that stuck with me my whole life. For me, it was important to find out what had happened to the original cars during the filming. That was gonna be my new dream car. I had to have an original Herbie. I had to find an original stunt car. So this is exactly what the car looked like when I got it. It was interesting to research how many cars were used for each film. Um, obviously, when you're a kid, you think there's just one. <laughs> you know, there's one Herbie that did it all, but the reality of it is, is, is there were 10 or 11 cars for the first movie and as many as 26 for Herbie Goes Bananas. And this is um, expendable car rigged to tow driverless and release over the cliff by the Apollo. This particular car was number 10 for the love bug. I left all of this stuff exactly like it was when I got the car. I didn't want to do a restoration on this car. I basically wanted to preserve what was here um, and make the car functional again. The last scene that this car was involved in is sort of what sealed its fate for the love bug. You see the car catch air and it goes down a ditch. Um, cliff, whatever you want to call it, and it's basically never seen again. Now in the movie, they cut to a tree and the car is hanging from a tree, but that's not this car. My car completed its last stunt when it went over the side of that culvert. Seeing the movie as a child and then revisiting the movie as an adult, it makes you realize how much of a children's movie it's not. There's very serious, darker sort of underlying issues with the movie. I mean, Hurry tries to commit suicide. When you think of a Disney movie, you don't generally think of a character wanting to kill themselves. And I think everybody loves the underdog aspect of it, the plucky underdog that comes out on top. And who doesn't love that story? But I've seen the movie more times than I care to admit. <laughs> but this is how we packaged everything so when we picked it up. Um, and what's neat, he put out all the windows in these burlap bags. This is a vent wing window was wrapped in this newspaper, which is dated Sunday, June 14th, 1992. The Spokesman Review and Spokane Chronicle. $700, 74 bug, missed those prices. 67 bus, 1200 bucks. I wish I had a time machine. 
This is just a hobby for me. I mean, I'm a, I'm a garage hack. You know, I, I just learn as I go. I'm a tinker by nature. I love to take things apart and try and put them back together. And it's just a lot of fun. It's a way for me to kind of get out of the stress of day-to-day -day life and just get out to the garage and just work on something. And the hunt is a big part of it. You know, there's always that treasure hunting side of you that, uh, that it's just, you know, takes you back to a kid when you go Easter egg hunting for Easter. It's the same scenario. You just get excited when you start finding them. So you got 30 bucks on them? And even if they're a complete basket case, it's still fun to find them and try and extract them. And, and I'm always on the hunt looking. Palm green, sand green, palm green. I call it more of a resuscitation than a restoration. I'm not trying to get a show vehicle here. I want to get it back to where it's in good drivable condition. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle because that's ultimately all it is. You're just trying to put all the pieces back together and make them fit and work. So you got a 20,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. It gets daunting real quick. And if you let your mind think like that, you get completely overwhelmed and it's very easy to lose sight and that's why you see a lot of unfinished projects out there. One thing I've learned over the years is to take one component at a time. My wife's great. She always kind of giggles and, and smiles whenever I'm pulling out some Hulk from God knows where. And she loves seeing them too. My wife is from Brazil and she's grown up with beetles and buses her entire life. But she, she's used to it enough now, so she knows. I mean, once the parts start infiltrating inside the house, then we got a real problem. And I hope it's gone soon. Do you? Everything tends to stay out in the garage and out in the back back of the house and whatnot, and, and she's okay with that. And she knows that, you know, it's, it's a hobby that I enjoy. In the 50s in America, the slur against the Beatle often was that this is Hitler's car. There's this little guilty part of me that was always there, like my car that's my favorite car is the one that the Nazis championed. It's like, it's a hard thing to reconcile. If you see movies today about Second World War, you see German soldiers driving, you see them in a Schwimmbahn or in the Beetle. It just burned into the mind of everybody. Not only Volkswagen, but Germans in, in, as a whole have a bit of a problem with the Second World War and what happened. The Chancellor Hitler at the time wanted a car for the people. There was a new autobahn system all over Germany and they wanted a practical, cheap family car that people could afford to, and that would have a good sort of fuel consumption. I freue mich. The thing about the Beetle is that it's had its story told possibly more often than any other car. It's supposedly a well-known story, but the problem is it's been mistold vastly more often than anything accurate has been told. There's the misinformed side of the people who think Hitler designed it, which of course, that's not true at all. Hitler wasn't an automotive designer, as you may or may not be aware of. He had another line of work that he was quite involved with. The people who are a little more informed uh, usually will say Ferdinand Porsche designed it, which is not inaccurate as such. Yes, the actual final design that became the Beetle did come from Ferdinand Porsche, and he you know, refined it to be the most recognizable auto design in the world. But that answer is missing a huge, huge component. Cars had become the big question of the future, you know, after the First World War. So you had many people talking about it, writing about it, thinking about it in the universities, in the newspapers, uh, all over Europe. In America at the time, uh, Henry Ford had invented the Model T, which was a people's car. The idea of what was happening in America, this mass motorization where normal people working normal jobs could afford a car, that was a huge change. A car comes off the end of the line every 10 seconds. People were talking about that in Europe on many different levels, hoping that somehow they could create a car that would do what the Model T did in America. Ferdinand Porsche did not come up with this concept of the car that became the Beetle just out of thin air. There were a number of designers experimenting with various pieces of this. He's actually working within kind of a collective school of thought, a general set of ideas for what could make a great people's car. 
And there were some very key players that arguably did more to develop what the Beatle became than Portia did himself. Some of these people have been almost erased from the historical record. There was a motor journalist at the time named Joseph Gans. He wrote for a magazine called Motor Critic. He was a Jew. You have a very important person, Yosef Gans, writing about it quite a lot and making a big stir about Germany needs a car, needs, a, needs a, to motorize a population like America, and this is the future. He himself was contracted by companies to make cars as well, to design things. And when he started designing cars on his own, he would use a backbone chassis, again, something that you'll see later in the Beetle, swing axles, also the later Beetle, engine behind the driver, and streamlined bodies. And if you think about what the early Beetle was, it was all of these things. And he actually called this car the Maybug. So we even get entomological names. The seeds of what became the Beetle were there. This was a pool of ideas. And one of the biggest people who input into that pool was Joseph Gans. He was incredibly vocal, um, and he was unabashed in, in going for this idea. He was had a lot of passion for it. Gans' biggest success was a car called the Standard Superior. And the Standard Superior, if you look at it now, looks a hell of a lot like a very, very early Beetle. So the Standard Superior was a little Beetle-like car. It was two-door, it had a backbone chassis, rear-mounted engine, and this car was sold. It was sold, and it was sold under the name Volkswagen, in the generic sense of the name. There's ads from that era, and, you know, standard superior, and it cost like 1,600 Reichmarks, and it was one of the cheapest cars you could get in Germany at the time. You can trace the roots of the Beetle back to Joseph Gans as much as you can Ferdinand Porsche, I believe. Many of those people were Jewish, as it turned out, and were persecuted when uh, the Nazis came to power. So a lot of their stories have sort of gotten lost. He was eventually forced out of his position in the magazine Motor Critic because of pressure from the Nazis. They were taking away his livelihood. He was actually imprisoned. Um, they just made life intolerable for him. And these people used his status as a Jew as a way to basically just eliminate him as uh, any sort of credible threat. And in the end, you know, they won. Joseph Gans was effectively erased from the VW story. It's a relief, in a way, that Seminole in the Beatles' design may have actually been a Jew himself. It's like this thing wasn't entirely, you know, born out of these horrible circumstances by this madman. Germany was partitioned after the war, and the Allies each took a zone. So you had the British zone, you had the American zone, you had the Russian zone, and the French zone. And the Volkswagen factory happened to be in the British zone. So it's a kind of difficult thing to stomach, the idea that, that Hitler was involved. So I focus more on the British army going in there and teaching the bloody Nazis how to behave, you know. That's what I like to focus on. <laughs> Part of the reason why the British were so eager to get it up in production was so the Russians couldn't have it. There was also a big economic need because a lot of Germans now were suddenly destitute, without jobs, without anywhere to go. The British really kind of fell in love with the car. There was a man named Ivan Hurst who uh, was a British officer who found himself um, in control of the plant at the end of the war and also unexpectedly sort of fell in love with the car in a way that would forecast the way millions of people would fall in love with the car. It was largely due to his efforts that the car survived the occupation of Germany and eventually was in the position to become a mass-marketed vehicle. The Volkswagen in general is very, very important for the Germans because it meant to forget about uh, the sadness of the war and begin a new economic life again. So the Beetle was like this you know, refugee. It should have been in this timeline that died off. There were so many times it could have just ended there. The Beetle would be this weird thing you'd see in museums. They built a few of these weird Beetle cars in the 30s, and these were the basis for the German Jeeps, and wasn't that strange. But that's not what happened. The Beetle jumped ship. It got into our timeline, and instead of dying off here, it thrived. you know, working in the food industry. My job is considered art, but it, but to me it's a craft because it's a learned skill. Whereas I guess art is something that's more inherent. Daddy, can I have chocolate? You want chocolate? Yeah. Eat it. 
The original color of this beetle was all black. But what I'm thinking it would be nice because we want to put the logos on there to really make them pop. If we do two tone and do white on the lower and black everywhere else, that'll pop really nicely. The posh logos. What do you think? Oh, posh logo. Can you pull that logo off? Yeah, it's going to be a magnet, so we can take it off when we don't need it. It looks like it's painted. Exactly. It. Yeah. That's nice. We can do a. Posh surfboard on top. That would be neat. <laughs> I'd love to make a posh surfboard. So we could either do it like this or we could do it like this. It's going to be tough. I can definitely match that paint. Daddy. Yeah? Yeah. Painting is, is the fun part. Once you got all the prep done and everything's nice and straight and you can finally lay on the color and see the color finally coming to life, that's when the actual gratification of the hours and hours of hard work come into play. Well, every time I paint is a learning experience. And what I learned from this experience is I really don't know shit. There's no end to what you can do when you own a car. No longer locked on the land, the farmer's wife can get away from the farm for a while and take the baby down the road for a visit. Humans have the desire for two things, and that's freedom, but also control. And those two things don't necessarily go together. You can't have anarchy and structure. But when it comes to mobility, we have a way to look at it in a different way. We are always trying to be free, which means we want to see more and do more and experience more and have the chance to do what we want. And mobility is a reflection of that. You know, we find ever new ways to explore. First, the, you know, the bicycle, the motorcycle, the car, the airplane. These are all ways of us extending our feeling of freedom and and power and also control because on the train you don't have any control. I mean, you have the control to buy the ticket and then someone takes you from point A to point B. With the automobile, you have this direct relationship between your freedom and your control because you're in control of the car and you're free to take it where you want to take it. But you also need rules, structure, stoplights, all that stuff and that comes through control. With autonomous cars and self driving Google vehicles and everything else, you know, I feel like we can still sort of hold on to that romantic idea of having the power to go out and drive your own car however fast or however slow you want to go, go where you want to go. It's an extremely therapeutic thing for me. You know, with all the stress of society and, and, and work and everything else, some people like to go play sports. Some people go to the bar to unwind. I just get behind the wheel of an old bug and drive. My first car was a Beetle. You know, your first car, it's a life changer, isn't it? When, you, when you're a teenager and you have a car that's yours, that you've worked for, and it, it's the first time you have independence like that. And where I lived in Scotland, it was so beautiful there, you know, and I, I could go wherever I wanted. And I'd been sort of limited to places that I could cycle my bicycle to. And now I could go much, much further. You know, I could drive it into Edinburgh. I could go to Glasgow and go to big cities. I remember the, uh, I had a stereo in it and I had uh, orchestral maneuvers of the Darks album. There's some music now that when I hear, I'm just back in that Green Beetle. Room. <laughs> it's just perfect. It's perfect. I've reflected on why do I love this car so much, and I've looked back, and I've and my parents had them in the 70s when I was just growing up. Um, 
There's a picture of my mother holding my brother as a baby who's two years older than me in front of a red beetle in Glasgow, I think. And then there's a picture of me as a schoolboy, like five years old, standing in front of an orange beetle that we had. I'm sure that's why I ended up buying one when I was 16, because I, I, I love them. I love the shape of them, and I, I'm, I've known them since I was, you know, nothing, really, I guess. My goal is to get the interior done and then work my way out. Once the interior is completely done, then it's focusing on the mechanicals, like brakes and shock, suspension, engine, wiring, and then boom, turn the key and see what happens. Hopefully it doesn't. That's where we're at. Curved glass is remarkably strong compared to flat glass because of the curve adds strength, rigidity. When we do the windshield, it's a completely different story. I find that getting yourself in the right frame of mind to do this work is essential. And the windshield on these early bugs are flat glass. And the flat glass is very delicate to work with. And I've broken enough of them installing them to know that it's something you just gotta take your time with. I've, usually when I split them, that's usually right when I get to the end, and it, right down the middle. <laughs> Fuck, that scared the shit out of me for a second. <laughs> nice All right, it's in. It was 1949, and the Cold War and everything was getting bigger, including automobiles. That's when we arrived, and they couldn't even spell our name right. The whole thing seemed like a comedy, because were they actually going to try to sell this in the US? A man named Ben Pond, who was instrumental in the creation of the bus, the Type 2, wanted to see this car come to America. So in 1949, he loaded up a couple of the cars on a ship, and they went to America uh, with great hopes that, you know, everyone would fall in love with this car. And the opposite happened. The custom officials laughed at the car and said, are you trying to sell this here? You know, like, are you crazy? Like, good luck, you know? Well, they got some people to go along, and they sold two in 1949. People thought the car was ugly. They called it the baby Hitler. All the press was bad, you know. It couldn't have been worse, to be honest. It was just a disaster. So the car was definitely not embraced by America at first. Vacation, that wonderful American institution of going new places and doing new things. In the 1950s in America, it was a boom time and cars became very big, and it was all about sort of the glamour and the ornamentation and the bigness. So you can see how the Beetle didn't fit into that at all. It was sparse and, you know, the opposite of all of that. But then you had another generation that was growing up, and they looked at what their parents were doing and all of this uh, consumption and big houses and keeping up with the Joneses, and they didn't really want that. There were people in America who were getting a little sick of these massive, thirsty cars. And so you had a countercultural movement in the 60s. Like all countercultural movements, it's basically doing the opposite of what had come before, more towards simplicity and freedom. Somehow, the Beetle was finally at just the right point to ride that wave. It was really a matter of timing because it couldn't have worked before this exact moment. Now, 
Mr. Jones and Mr. Crampler were neighbors. They each had $3,000. With his money, Mr. Jones bought himself a $3,000 car. With his money, Mr. Crampler bought himself a new refrigerator, a new range, a new washer, a new dryer, a record player, two new television sets, and a brand new Volkswagen. Now Mr. Jones is faced with that age-old problem, keeping up with the Kremplers. Here was a car that was being marketed as different, as honest, as meaningful, and that was stark contrast to all other cars that were out at the time. And that's what they, they sold themselves on, these very humble ideas of what a car could be. And a lot of this came from the advertising campaign that Doyle Dame Birnbach came up with in the late 50s and early 60s. That was most Americans' first real introduction to Volkswagen. And it was an idea that stuck with them, a concept and a, and a, a cultural identity uh, that stuck with them for decades. I think they've sort of gotten away from that philosophy of what you see is what you get. Um, there's an honesty about that that you don't really see anymore. They would have been happy to tell you it's not beautiful, but they would have given you half a dozen reasons why the look made sense and why it was the right thing to do. And it all would have worked. Nobody does that anymore. You can't get that honesty in a car company anymore. It just doesn't happen. Monday, we're gonna pick up the motor. It's coming FedEx and uh... Since I'm a resident, they can't get it here because it's on a pallet, so we're going to go pick it up, and that's going to be fun. Cool. So they'll just uh, we'll wheel right on out over there? Yeah, the uh, ramp right ramp? over there. Perfect. Yeah, right 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 I'll get my best guy on it. Thanks, man. Okay. Right on that tailgate there? Right on it. You going to hold it? We'll find out. Ah. Oh, yeah, that's no problem. No problem at all. I thought it'll actually fit right in there. What's it on? Threading a needle. She's got three inches on each side. Go so this way here, this way here, okay? Go back that way here, okay? You're in. Got half an inch on each side at most. Now getting it out to a whole other matter, that's gonna be breaking it out of the crate. It was gonna get in my bus one way or another. And it did. <laughs> this is my very first turn key motor. It's pretty. Bathroom, drink, coffee. Uh, I'm good right now. You're good. I'm assuming you probably want to see your car. You're kind of a lot. You kind of waited yeah. a little yeah. while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, look at that. Very, 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 very cool. Little piece of history. Oh, I'm, I'm dying to get it in the light there and really check it out. This is a 1950 and it uh, was one of the first Beatles that was officially imported into the U.S. 
You know, I think it was a total of like 163 Beatles that he brought over in 1950. And this is one of those cars. Here's a copy of the, the birth certificate. It shows where it was produced, where it came to Hoffman in New York. So this shows the, the motor number, which 219427. Right there, so 219427. So that's the original engine for this car. That's such a rarity to find one that hasn't had the motor swapped out. It's just, that's really, really, really cool. The car has a story to tell. So it's not just another 50 Beetle, it was one of the first Beetles that came into the US. And the US is a major market for the Beetle throughout the, the history of Volkswagen. I mean, these first few cars as they came over were the drop in the water that turned into the the waves that uh, took it so huge. The Beetle became this mass market phenomenon. More cars of any model of the Beetle have been made than anything else. I love those pictures of the factories where you just see hundreds of Beetles lined up or the loading onto double-decker trains. And I love all lo looking at all those pictures. It's like a, I feel like a kid in a sweetie shop. I wish I could get in there and take a few, you know, have a few just for myself. They're produced all over the world and assembled in many different countries. The biggest factories, Germany, Mexico, and Brazil, but parts being assembled in Thailand and Indonesia, South Africa. I always feel like that when I look at them. I like the older ones, I like the newer ones. I'd like to have a 70s Beetle again. I, I, you know, I'd like to have one from every year. That's not asking too much, is it? <laughs> These are really, really good quality horsehair padding. So I'm excited to use these. And these springs are in great shape. Doesn't look like any work to them has been done. Ow! Fingers. That looks good. The original manufacturing of the coconut fiber for the seat padding was done in India. The materials that Volkswagen used in the, in the 60s um, especially in the interiors, as they age, they soak up smells and they create their own smell. And there's something about that Volkswagen smell that is, brings you back. It's maybe uh, the trademark of a, of, of a video, you know? It's the smell, it's, it's amazing. The petrol tank's not very far away from you. It's right in front of your knees which is not a great place I'm supposed to have one. But anyway, there it is. So you're getting a little whiff of the petrol and you smell the oil. From, you've, got an, you've got all of the mechanical smells that I love and that are in there. It's a little on the musty side. It's probably from the horsehair padding. No matter how much you vacuum, you're gonna have the horsehair padding falling apart and underneath the seat. Horsehair. So I feel like it's a combination of whatever that weird straw horsehair seat fill, gasoline, and rubber. And then all cooked, all gradually cooked by the, the driving of your car. I mean, it's so airtight in there. All of those smells are just creating this great Volkswagen Beetle smell that when you open the door and get in, you, you're enveloped by. And uh, it smells good. For me, the Volkswagen smell is my childhood. My mom owned a very nice, low mileage 66 bug. This was a car that my mother picked me up and dropped me off to school in every single day. And that was the highlight of my day, was getting picked up in that car. The moment I would sit in that car and I would smell that, everything was okay in that moment. It's just an incredibly nostalgic smell. And I recently lost my mom. And that, that smell is really gonna remind me of her more than anything. And 
that's what was so remarkable about this car that I just bought that has 19,000 miles on it because that car instantly transports me back to my childhood. My parents would take me to Volkswagen shows when I was eight, nine, 10 years old. I mean, I didn't even have a driver's license and they would drive me eight hours one way to go to a Volkswagen show. I go to a VW show and it's like walking into the bar at Cheers and, hey, Norm, you know, there's something that's really cool about that. When I'm with the VW crowd, it's home. You know, I know if I've got a problem, today I was having mechanical problems with the car and I knew if I broke down, somebody would be there to help me. I didn't have to worry about it. People do come together. It's a, it's a neat family of people. It doesn't really matter if it's a Beetle or a bus or a Type 3 or whatever it is. There is a real Volkswagen camaraderie, and, and it's, it's quite nice. And also, it's not even just people in Volkswagens. You know, you get waves from other people, and I, I forget, even when I'm not in, driving my Beetle, if I'm driving another car, I'm always waving to Beetles, and they're like, why, why is he waving at me, you know? Then... So it's always fun. It's always... There's always a turning head with a smile. You know, everybody looks at you, Everybody smiles, everybody uh, says hello. It's very nice. It's a relatively inexpensive hobby to get into, for one. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna restore a car, so to speak, or, or build a kit car or Baja bug or do, go for the cow look, or just to go stock, it's compared to other cars that you could get into, it's still relatively inexpensive. The Beetle pan itself, the engine, transmission, wheels, body pan of the Beetle, was an independent unit. You could lift the body off a Beetle and have a drivable chassis. They weren't just economy cars. People would have a lot of fun in these things too. The Myers Manx, the first dune buggy that we think of as a dune buggy, fiberglass body on a Beetle pan, and you had a good time and it was cheap. That opened up an entire industry of kit cars, the likes of which we still have never seen replicated today. Like you could have, you could make a Beetle pan look like almost anything. It's kind of neat seeing the Beetle in particular being able to take off on so many different platforms that on that chassis, you can come up with so many different configurations. It's almost like the Mr. Potato Head because you can put so many different pieces together on it and it always works no matter what. They always tend to fit and you can turn it into something really cool. You can go buy a Volkswagen for a thousand bucks and have something in common with some rich dude that just spent $200,000 on a Volkswagen. The Volkswagen has now really spread across so many different levels of people from basic transportation to high-end collectible. It's a 1949. And the Beetle was classless in a way that we don't really have anymore. Nowadays, status is such a big deal when people buy cars. That wasn't the case with the Beetle. Everybody knew how cheap a Beetle was. A Beetle cost like half of what a average American compact car cost in like the 60s and 70s. You could be a rich person driving a Beetle with no shame. You could be someone famous in a Beetle, and it was like, cool. It's a force that kind of holds everybody together, and I, I like that a lot. O Fuca foi o meu primeiro carro que eu comprei. Esse, esse carro eu aprendi a dirigir nele, depois de 54 anos. Como eu já, já dirigia trator, foi, foi fácil aprender a dirigir o Fuca. Ela tem, a Regina tem, minha, minha esposa tem esclerose múltipla, sabe? Então ela, ela até anda no trator, mas sofre um pouco, né? O trator fica incômodo, né? Aí depois eu comprei o Fuquinha aí ela. Nossa, tá feliz. O peso meu peito em pedaço. 
Se eu pôr no gasolina dele, tem uma bateria tão boa. Que é nada. carro de guerra, né? nem água de guerra, nem água vai. Você fez This is the clutch, brand new, sacks, clutch alignment tool, goes in through that pilot bearing that we just replaced. moments that you get so incredibly frustrated that you want to just basically light a match and walk away. They all teach you patience to a certain degree. Just when you think that you turn a corner for the better, uh, something else will set you back. And you just gotta, sometimes you just gotta learn to walk away and sit down in a quiet place and think about it for a bit. The word came as a quiet announcement yesterday. Sales have been declining and prices rising and the standard Volkswagen Beetle will no longer be imported into the United States. More Beetles have been sold than any other car in history, 19 million worldwide, 5 million in the U.S. In late 1974, VW started sending fewer of the old standby over so that more of the new Rabbit model, mechanically completely different, could be produced. But the original model, which created the market for economy cars, has ended its 28-year run on these shores. Japanese imports were coming in that were about as cheap as the Beetle, about as efficient, could hold more people, were just more modern designs. And the Bug had been making these incremental improvements for a long time and all of a sudden found real competitors for the first time. Ask for it, you got it, Toyota. Volkswagen was realizing this is what we've got. Subaru, the economy car for today's economy. Frankly, VW just hadn't kept developing aggressively enough to really keep, you know, with the times. When the Japanese market came in and started to take the wind out of the sails of the Beetle, that killed the Beetle to a certain extent in the U.S. market, you know, in 79, it was done. You know, the fact that they stopped making it, I mean, they made them for so long. Can imagine our car being produced for that length of time? It's, it's unrivaled, isn't it? It's, it only adds to its preciousness, you know, the fact that it's, not being built anymore in that form. I, in Mexico, continued to crank out Beetles until 2003. They continued longer than any other factory around the world. VW went into Mexico pretty early, into the 50s. The Beetle was extremely well suited to Mexico in particular. Mexico had that combination of a population that needed good, cheap transportation, uh, road and working and living conditions that tended to be a little more difficult, which would kind of weed out some of the more fragile, cheap cars that would have been out there.
Es bueno recordarlo. Volkswagen, la mejor compra. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing a Beetle in some capacity, be it a taxi or a civilian used car. Beetles were everywhere. Beetles are what made Mexico function. You know, it's a big country. Big, hot, dusty roads. So not having to fill a radiator was kind of a big plus. So with a combination of simple, accessible, rugged, common, part swapping between the various years, all of these things added up to something that works really well for an emerging country. And, you know, that, the same reasons why it was successful at all is why it made sense as a cab. If you're driving it every day and you want to run, you want parts available. Like, why would you pick something exotic for a cab? And it makes so much sense that they even overlooked some of the flaws in the Beetle for a cab. Two door is not an ideal cab, but they always took out that front seat and you just climbed in, piled on the back, and however many people can cram in there. And it worked, and it worked for a really long time. The Beatles are disappearing from the Mexico City streets. I cannot remember a time with no VW taxis in Mexico. The emissions problems in Mexico City were completely out of control, and also safety reasons, the fact that they weren't four doors, um, and there were some sketchy things going on in the taxi cab. The government's answer to all of this was, we need to outlaw two-door taxis. Passengers need a means of egress if something goes wrong, so four-door taxis are in, two-door taxis are out. It's a shame to, to see all these taxis here. They are waiting for the, for the deadline, for the doomsday. <laughs> There was a lot of bad feelings about the, the Mexico City taxi. Many of uh, these taxis were used to commit crimes. 20 years ago, the chances to get robbed or maybe raped in a taxi beetle was very high. There were a lot of incidents. They are known as express kidnappings. And that's basically where you would hail one of these cabs. They would go a couple blocks, turn down an alley. Somebody would get in. They would put a gun to you and take you to ATMs that would basically empty your account. As long as you cooperated, you lived at the end of it. There's no chances to run away when you are a passenger in a taxi beetle. The driver locked the door, and you are there. It had to come to an end. It's I guess part of our story, you know. It's so sad, like, you had lines and lines and rows of these Beatles that were cars that any of us up here in the United States would gladly own, that we could, if nothing else, use parts from. And these cars were being crushed and stacked. There were rows miles long of these cars that, that are piled three, four, five Beatles high, and as long as the eye can see, and it just broke my heart. By this point, obviously, they're all off the road. They've already been outlawed. You know, all of the licenses have expired. They're, they're all gone, basically, which has really changed the landscape of Mexico City. You know, there's a certain charm about going down there and seeing all of these little beetles, you know, buzzing around. And I kept going back and looking at these pictures of these cars getting crushed that were stacked up, and I, I had to do something about it. I think back to like the 50s and 60s, and I'm always questioning why people didn't think to save more of these cool cars, these significant cars. And so when an opportunity comes up in present day that I would think 20 years from now, we look back and think, why didn't we save any of these cars? These were an important part of history. I don't know, I think it's, it's another one of those big collectibles like Herbie that just sort of sits in the garage, but I get a certain satisfaction from knowing that I was able to save one and that there's one less beetle that got crushed. I'm getting nervous about firing this thing up for the first time. Your initial startup on this can go in so many different directions. And you gotta understand, every single system in this bug was disassembled. So, 
that's a lot of variables right there. Hopefully we won't need that. All right, let's put the battery in, crank the engine until fuel makes its way here and it's got a ways to travel. I mean, it's got to travel from the front of the Beetle all the way to here and at three and a half PSI, that'll take some time before it gets there. And then it's one of these. Then once it fires, then I've got to start, you got to run it at a high RPM and then I'm going to listen for expensive noises. This is it. This is the first startup in over 20 years. Sounds like my uh, battery is starting to wear down too. it had ran in 23 years. That's an incredible feeling to know that you just brought something back to life. You, you, uh, you're putting another one back on the road. It's a, it's a really good sense of accomplishment. Some of them will fight you every step of the way. Some of them will get back together and get on the road quickly. This one definitely fought me putting it back together, but uh, we're working out the kinks slowly together. It took enough of my skin and blood and pride <laughs> for sure. VW used to be extremely conservative technologically. Basically, they had one fundamental platform that they worked with, and they stretched that platform to everything. It's sort of like there was a split in Volkswagen technologically that happened in the 70s. And this is the split that most of us understand is when VW went from air-cooled rear engines to water-cooled front engines. And from that moment on, that's the break. From that moment on, technology and innovation took on a very different role at Volkswagen. In 98, the new Beetle came out, and all of a sudden, Volkswagen was in the eyes of America again. Even though they had been here during the 20-year gap, you know, dealerships were closing. It was not a real happy time for Volkswagen in the US but the new Beetle was really the shot in the arm that they needed. A lot of people rushed out to buy them thinking that they were gonna feel those same feelings and smell those same smells. And when they realized it was just like every other car out on the road, I think they were a little disappointed. The new Beetle may look a bit like the old one, but it's not the same car. Nowhere near the same. It was still a neat car, uh, and it still made people smile like the old Beetle did. They added a diesel option on the new Beetles, and it was a good option. But you know, I mean, they're a completely different car company at this time, and a completely different car. Scandal and the fallout over Volkswagen's cheating of emission standards grew today. The EPA alleged there was deceitful software in half a million cars. Today, Volkswagen raised that number significantly and tried to restore consumer trust. The way everybody knew Volkswagen, their original reputation was they were the honest car company. When it was found that Volkswagen was cheating on their diesel emissions, there's a lot of interesting things going on there. For one thing, they sold the cars under the guise that you're doing something good for the environment. You're using less fuel. You know, they were selling these things as clean diesels. That was specifically what they called them. The person who's going to be interested in such a car is someone who gives a damn about the environment, about the economy. And VWs lied to them. There's no way around it. They were lied to by a company. And that's a really hard thing to recover from. Our company was dishonest with the EPA and the California Air Resources Board and with all of you. And in my German words, we have totally screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> 
what you've got, your three goals are power, efficiency, and cleanliness of exhaust. And you can't have all three of those. So the question is, why did VW feel like they had to have everything? You can trace back why to a reaction against what VW used to be. The old ideas of slow refinement, making everything perfect for what it was, even if it's an archaic design. And from there, we get into what modern VW became, which is a much more technology-oriented company. There's a lot of arrogance and pride associated with this. This whole scandal feels like something that came out of this arrogance, but I imagine there was pressure from the very top, like we have to be the best. We have to provide a diesel that gets insane mileage and insane power, and nobody else can touch it. And the thing is, they just hit up against the wall of physics and engineering and reality, and they couldn't quite get there. This can be a chance to really reinvent themselves in maybe a way that they've needed to since before this even happened. Since everyone's conducting a mileage test, we at Volkswagen thought we'd conduct one. So we modified our body and our engine and used someone who didn't weigh much to drive. And we got 84 miles per gallon. Ridiculous. Nobody normally drives like this? That's precisely our point. Nobody normally drives like most of those tests. Magnets turned out perfect, man. I used the leftover white paint from the door to paint the, the magnet itself, and then we matched the black in vinyl. So. Yeah, that's beautiful. Looks awesome. The number you dialed has been changed, <laughs> disconnected, or is no longer in service. So I want to find Corky because now I want to get back in touch with her so I can set up a, a time to, to meet up with her and show her the bug and show her the finished product. And I'm not exactly sure why her number would be disconnected unless she moved. So i got to try and figure out a way to get in touch with her or a family member. I can try Facebook. If you feel you have reached this recording in error, please check the number and try your call again. Power. There goes a hubcap, we gotta get that. Shit. Not bad. And when I first saw it, it looked like it had a big old dent inside of it, but a little bit of road rash, just some character to it. So moral of the story is keep it at 63. 65 hubcaps go flying off. The sad truth of this whole thing is that you don't see them anywhere. Worldwide, they're disappearing at an alarming rate. It is sad that as time goes on, there's a limited number left. And because of that, and because of more and more people fall in love with this car, then to own one actually becomes something which feels competitive. I think that's the word that bothers me, is that you should feel like you have to snatch up this car and put it in your collection, you know, because then the story gets lost, you know. And if you lose the story, then I do think you're losing the heart of the car. Something that was so common is now incredibly unique. How crazy is that in just 40 years? In recent years, the scrap prices have gone up a lot. So you've had a lot of the older junkyards in the Midwest, especially, and up north, basically cash out on these cars. We found an old crappy looking car that looked like it had been in an alley for most of its life. and. Uh, put it back on the road. And I love that. I love, put, I love sort of the idea of um, saving them, you know. The Beetle started out as a, as a tool, as a mode of transportation. It was like any other product that's out there in the world. But it's endeared itself with 
people that have experienced it through their life and now collectors that want to relive those memories and and have that emotion back or holding on to these things tightly. Even in the last, since I bought mine here in America, like the prices of them are going crazy. This car maybe three or four years ago might have been $30,000 or something like that. And now it's probably double that. Right. That's I mean, extraordinary. And, and what, what happens, I suppose, is encourages people to drive them less. I mean, I think if you're, if you're paying that kind of money for a car, then it does become something that sits in a collection or in a collector's collection. And, and, and maybe doesn't get driven very much. I, I, I like to drive mine. I like, I like to get mine out and give them a blast, you know. There's something about being in this little blue car that's really just one of my favorite places in the world it is. I love the, the simplicity of it all, and it's so, it's so very beautiful. <laughs> I think it's got a lot to do with not growing up. Somewhere in me is still that 16-year-old boy who got his first car and never kind of got over it. I don't like that sort of lie that we're fed by that sort of capitalist idea that you need the new phone, you need the new stereo, you need the new car. Every year they bring out a car, which is like last year's, but it's, they've done this to make you want the new one and make you also feel bad about having the old one. And I don't like to live like that. I don't, I don't think that's important. Corky Lord, there she is. Look at that. On the beach, retired. So through Facebook, I was able to connect with her grandson. The good news is Corky is happy and healthy and made arrangements to meet up with them out at the cabin. So next weekend, we're gonna drive the bug out there. So even though we're in Montana, I'm gonna put the uh, classic Idaho 1960 bug plates on that her grandkids bought for Bob for this beetle. I think that'll be a nice little touch. I really hope she likes it. I'm not exactly sure uh, what her expectations are, if she has any expectations. I'm excited to take it out to her and follow through on my promise. It was a beautiful fall day. The sun was shining. You know, it was a finally uh, first real opportunity I had to get it out on, on a long drive. And it uh, gave me a lot of time to really reflect back on the, the year leading up to this moment. Here it comes. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> that one looks in the dark. No, it doesn't. Hey, even the lights work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come here, Mom. I tried to reuse everything that Bob put away, everything that he stored for. This is all original to the Beetle. You see, you know, it's got the, it's got its little marks in it, and yes, it's got fresh paint, but it needed that. Absolutely. Yeah, the rest of the stuff didn't need to be. It would have fresh paint if he lived. But if, right. you, if you if you do one of those restores where you know you put everything brand new on it and everything, you you bury the history of that car, you bury exactly. the history of where it's been. I think it was great for my mom in a lot of different ways to be able to see it restored and brought back. I think it gives her a sense of closure, a sense of 
we completed what you started. We were able to find someone that did that. And so I think that just closes that door for my mom. I was feeling nervous about the bug breaking down. <laughs> But uh, it didn't. It actually ended up being a pretty uh, remarkable day. The reaction from Corky and Jerry and their family on on this beetle and what it, what it meant to them was worth every bloody knuckle. With all the challenges, all the frustrations, went away the minute that I saw the reaction on their face. It's far better than I anticipated. I don't know what I thought, but I'm amazed. I really am. Just a beautiful car. They're pretty cars, aren't they? Amazing. Daylight, 22 years. <laughs> Knowing my dad, my dad gave out very few hugs. Uh, he loved me and I loved him and that, that wasn't a question, but he wasn't, he was old school. He wasn't that, you know, always hug your son kind of like we are as fathers. Um, I think Jason would have gotten a hug from my dad. Nuts and bolts. You know, that's, that's what a car is. It's nuts, bolts, it's rubber, it's all of these things put together, an inanimate object. And somehow this car was able to get into all of our heads. It was able to touch our soul. It's something that we take to heart. It's a special thing. I don't think, I don't think there will ever be another car made like that. VW today feels so removed from the car that got them to where they are. The character of the original Beetle is not going to be hurt by what's happening now. It's unimpeachable in a lot of ways. The Beetle's already established itself. It's such an icon, it's no longer affected by almost anything VW can do today. And if you look at it, of course it isn't. It came from the Nazis. If that wasn't enough to smear the character of this car, a diesel scandal sure as hell isn't gonna do that. The, Be the Beetle is always gonna be above that crap. I don't think that there's a spot in the world that hasn't been touched by a bug. It definitely brings people together in a really amazing way. I mean, they call it the people's car and it, and it holds true today. It's not about the car. The car is just a medium to bring these people together, but it's the people. Everyone wants to be a part of a story, especially a continuous story. And this car gives you a way to be a part of that story. And it's a story that started with dark. The worst of us as humans is a part of this car's initial beginnings. It goes on to champion the best parts of us. We feel that we're part of that story, and we feel that we're part of something that should never have happened and wasn't supposed to happen and was impossible, but then became possible. That's an important thing about this car, is that we can be reinvented, that reinvention is possible, that we can change our story.